So, uh, yeah, let's talk about um, my talk. Now witness the, fire, uh, the firepower of this fully automated and mutable vault cluster. So before we should begin, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Peter Suter, and I'm a senior technical account manager at HashiCorp. Um, this basically means that I work with organizations that have um, started on the journey of using our enterprise uh, versions of the HashiCorp stack, um, and I work with them on the kind of deployment journey. Um, so this could be anything from sort of discussing roadmap, talking about use cases, coordinating with engineering and support and things like that. But ultimately, um, the point of my job and the name of my team is customer success. So I'm not successful until my customers are successful. Um, hence the name. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from London in the UK, uh, and I've been with HashiCorp since February of 2018. So a little kind of funny fact about me is that even though I'm from the UK, uh, I actually super into baseball. Um, I actually went to the Mariners game last night, and they won, so woo! Um, <laughs> Uh, and I really love coffee as well, so perfect place for it. And uh, the weather really made me feel, you know, very much like home. You know? <laughs> so enough about all that. What are we actually here to talk about? So uh, there's a small indie series of movies. I don't know if you've heard of them, called Star Wars. Uh, so in Return of the Jedi, there's a famous scene where basically uh, Luke finally finds out that it turns out the Death Star isn't as under construction as he thinks it is, and it's a fully operational uh, system, and it's going to start you know, doing bad things to the rebels. Um, so I thought, that's a pretty cool line. I'll use that in my talk. But ultimately, the main thing we're here to talk about is automation for Vault. So why do I want to talk about that? So as I mentioned, I'm on the customer success team. Um, it's my job to make sure customers are successful with Vault. Um, I've worked with a lot of customers all over the EMEA region, um, anywhere from finance companies to small, medium enterprise. You know, there's a big variety of what people are using, but all of them are getting lots of value from Vault. Um, and the analogy I like to use is that when you first start using Vault, especially when you're in the kind of proof of concept kind of phase or um, in a kind of dev environment, it's a lot like this. It's a cool, uh, kind of nifty speedboat. It can kind of do a load of cool things. You're using it as a secret server. Anything's really good. The problem is, as, things, uh, as you start to productionize it, as you start to integrate other teams, um, you're going to uh, start using manual processes to start with. Um, you're going to end up with something like this, really big anchor. Um, it's going to be dragging along the seabed and slowing everything down. So to stretch the metaphor even further, we're going to use the scissors of automation to cut that cord to the anchor. So to give you a little peek behind the scenes, when I submitted this talk, my idea was, you know, let's talk about automation. Let's talk about explicitly how to deploy Vault um, with tools that already exist. So I was going to kind of do a demo. I was going to go into the explicit things of what to do and what not to do when deploying Vault. The problem with that is um, there's a phrase in the UK, I don't know if you have it in the US as well, is how long is a piece of string? There's no perfect way to deploy Vault. There's some guidelines we give. There's some uh, recommendations we have. But you know, a lot of guidelines and recommendations, they don't always fit exactly with um, what your organization or company is doing. So then, instead, uh, I thought we'd take a kind of really top-down view. So that's actually a top-down view of Seattle itself, if you know this. Um, so the idea is that we're going to talk about some of the core concepts when automating Vault. And I'm going to throw in two bonus, really cool automation features that I'm not sure everyone knows about. But every time I've worked with customers on them, they found them really valuable. So hopefully, um, are you not feeling too cheated by the fact that I don't go into explicit detail about automation? So one key thing that I'm going to be kind of hammering home, pretty much all of the things I'm talking about um, in terms of automating Vault, is you want to reduce the blast radius. No system is perfect. What you want to do is that you have um, a controlled way when things go wrong. So if a token leaks, if something goes wrong with the deployment or automation, it should be a very small controlled way of it going wrong. So you want to control that blast radius. So all journeys start with a single step, so let's get started. So with any task or um, project, you want to start off by planning and thinking about things. Um, and these are the uh, four key docs that I would recommend that anyone go and read, if, even if you've got a slight interest in Vault. Um, these will really help you out with figuring out where you're going to go in the future. So the, the first one is the security model. This will go through um, what is and is not included in the threat model of Vault. That's a really good thing, especially if you're introducing Vault um, to a security team. 
a lot of the time they'll say like, they might say something like, what is the threat model? And you can say, here is the docs saying, what is the threat model? So some things are within scope, some things aren't. So it's good to know those off the bat before you try to start automating and deploying it in a way where it's something that we don't have as part of our threat model. So the other two, uh, other three posts there, we're gonna go through all of them really. Um, the production hardening guide, the deployment guide, and the reference architecture. So um, of the three, the production hardening guide goes into quite specifics about how to actually deploy and, and harden a vault infrastructure. But we're gonna pick out some of those and kind of drill down where they relate to actual automation. So the first one is single tenancy. So the idea is that Vault should be the only and main process running on the machine. Um, so when you do that, you're reducing the risk that another process running on the same machine, um, if the machine is compromised, it can interact with Vault and cause problems there. Um, and then we also talk about single tenancy in terms of the abstraction layer that you're using Vault within. So uh, the lowest abstraction is gonna be bare metal, then VMs, then containers. So the idea is that as you go up the abstraction levels, the, more, um, the, the higher the surface area of attack can be. That's not saying that we don't support Vault on containers, I and mean, I'm not telling you to go out and throw your VMs away and start using bare metal, but it's just a really good idea is that you should know for each level you're gonna increase that risk. And most of the time that's fine, if the, in, as long as you understand that as part of your kind of risk when doing this stuff. So tokens, so when Vault is first initialized, you get a root, a, a root token, um, and that's pretty much the keys to the kingdom. It can do anything, it can initialize, it can re-roll, it can, has permissions to do everything underneath it. So you should pretty much only really use that to do some initial very small bootstrapping, um, and then using that to maybe set up some authentication methods that then you then use to create sub-tokens after that. So as soon as you've done that, you should be rotating that root token away. You can actually create more root tokens with a, um, another token that has permissions to do that. Um, one thing I actually recommend is that you can even uh, take the uh, audit logs, you can actually log when a root token is used, and that should be something that you're using, uh, you're alerting on or have monitoring around. The idea is that if a root token is being used, that should be an extraordinary event. That should be something that people should know about. It shouldn't just be in the middle of the day a root token is being used, that something's definitely gone wrong there. So mutability, um, one of the other key features we talk about when doing automation. So the idea is that Vault itself, um, all its persistent um, kind of storage is done from the storage backend. So because Vault is using that um, for its persistence, if you decouple that, um, it allows man uh, Vault to be managed pretty immutably. So if you need to do something like upgrade to new versions, if you need to, put, if you need to expand your cluster, if you need to move it around, ultimately all of the um, ongoing data is kept in the storage backend. So as long as you're attaching to the same storage, um, you can bring old servers away and bring them back up. It means the upgrade process is a lot easier. You can just have a cluster, take the old one out, put a new one in, everything works great from there. Um, it reduces, uh, doing this means that you reduce the need for remote access and, uh, and the sort of more direct orchestration that could um, introduce security gaps. You don't really want someone logging into root on a vault box, really. And related to that, um, no system is perfect, and Vault is no exception there. The idea is that you want to have uh, all of the things that you're doing with Vault audited and logged somewhere. You want a second system of record to kind of have as a, uh, a way of finding out what's happened with your Vault servers. Um, so Vault has several audit backends. Um, so what you need to do is plug them into some sort of uh, log analyzing tool, so an Elk stack, Splunk, Datadog, whatever it is. And the idea is that you should have that tied into your monitoring and your alerting and your observability. Um, you should be able to know what's happening and where and detect those outliers. With all that in mind, um, one thing that I'd like to highlight, even on the actual um, page we talk about production hardening, we basically say like, you know, we try and hit these where possible. We're not expecting you to hit every single one. Um, especially a lot of people's you know, company policies, maybe they're even stronger than the ones we have, or maybe they directly contradict the um, advice we give. So things like turning off core dumps or turning off remote access completely, it's not always gonna work with how you do deployments. Um, but the idea is that you should be trying to hit as many of these as you can where possible. And specifically when it comes to automation, there's one extra point that I like to talk about. Uh, and I sort of call this virality. So the idea is that Whatever processes, tools, or even people are part of the automation pipeline and, and uh, system you're using with Vault, um, they need to be as secure as Vault is. They're gonna be part of Vault's uh, threat model. 
there's no point having a super hardened uh, with set cap and everything uh, all enabled on your vault server and all fantastic. And then you have a vault, uh, then you have a Jenkins server that can interact with it with a root token and do whatever it wants. It's the equivalent of having like a super nice, super secure safe and then just having a post it with the, with the uh, combination on the front. So you want to make sure that anything that's interacting with vault is now part of that threat model. Cool, so we've kept all that in mind, we've done the reading, we've figured things out, now we need to begin architecting. So the most basic Vault architecture um, would just be single node with the uh, storage backend. So the idea is that it's just a Vault server running, is using storage on local disk, and that's pretty simple. You can pretty much set that up in like a couple of minutes. But that's not very really resilient. Um, the minimum we really recommend would be a three node uh, cluster and a five node Vault cluster. The idea behind that is that you want to achieve uh, n minus two consistency, where if you lose two of the objects um, within the failure domain, it can be tolerated. Um, so the ideal size of a Vault cluster would be free. So console uh, achieves the replication and leadership through um, consensus and gossip. There's actually been a few good talks about that if you want to know more about that. But the idea is that the leader is done by consensus. So you need a, um, a quorum of active servers for that. So for that, you need five servers. Um, so this is the sort of simplest HA version of a Vault deployment you can really think of. But as you can probably guess, this isn't really giving us um, availability zone level uh, HA because if that AZ goes down, your entire Vault cluster goes down. So similar to what I said at the start of this talk, there's no silver bullet solution to deploying Vault. And this is why I ended up kind of pivoting from my original idea here. What you need to do is decide, based on your organizational needs, what you're actually going to do with your Vault deployment. So are you on-prem? Are you in the cloud? Are you doing a kind of hybrid solution? Are you replicating between some uh, VMware on-prem stuff with the cloud? Are you using an on-prem server but talking to services within a cloud? That's one of the things to think about and thinking about your sort of failed domains. Are you worried about AWS going wrong? Are you worried about your on-prem server going wrong? And if so, you know, figure out which ways you want to do the replication there. Are you on open source or enterprise? And if you're on enterprise, have you thought about disaster recovery and performance replicas? Um, and if you uh, go back to the links we talked about earlier on, in the reference architecture, we actually go through pretty much every combination uh, of Vault you can go for. So are you worried about AZ failure? If you are worried about AZ failure, do you have open source or do you have enterprise? If you have enterprise, are you worried about multiple AZ failure? So we have lots of different scenarios for doing that. You know, as you said, it's how long is a piece of string? There's loads of bits to it. We've gone through all that, we've decided things, we've figured out the core concepts, we've got the initial architecture, so now let's start building the building blocks behind the automation of Vault. So when you're starting doing this, is there some sort of tool out there, some sort of way of interacting with APIs and clouds to create these resources? It sounds like something we should probably do. There's this thing called Terraform, I don't know if you've heard of it, um, it's pretty good at doing that. So. We've got some pretty good prior art for doing this uh, under the HashiCorp namespace on GitHub. Um, there are repos for deploying Vault in uh, most of the architectures we talk about. Again, not extensively because there's so many variables, but it's at least a good baseline for doing this stuff. Um, who's heard of the, uh, the Vault Guides repo on GitHub as well? Anyone? A few hands out there. So that's pretty good because what that does is that it's um, little snippets of Terraform or scripting or just general step-by-step -step guides on how to do stuff, um, practical guides on how to do everything. So if you need to figure out how to automate a particular process, maybe it's the initial um, Shamir, key, uh, Shamir, Shamir key sharing, or um, an auth backend, or how to deploy in GCP versus AWS, those little snippets are a really good baseline for figuring out that stuff. Um, and also, I, as, I, as I said, I'm part of the customer success team. We also have an enterprise architecture team. I work very closely with them, um, and we actually have some more kind of detailed plans uh, around um, the best practice guide for doing Terraform with more options and kind of selective ways of doing that. If you want to know more, um, I'll put my contact details at the end or come talk to me after. Cool, so now we've actually created the resources behind Vault, the networking, the compute, the storage and all that. How do we actually conf uh, think of, configure Vault itself? Um, so you can do it with scripting, um, you can do it just using the Vault CLI or maybe even uh, hitting the API endpoints yourself or something like curl. But what we really uh, can use, if we, especially if you're already using Terraform to create those resources, is that there's actually a Vault um, uh, Terraform provider that will do this itself. So it will talk to the Vault APIs, it will configure it through that. 
with the added benefit that you can actually take the, the variables, the data sources, the resources you're creating as part of your initial creation and reference those in your vault uh, configuration. So for example, if you're configuring a particular IAM role to create the auth backend, you can then reference that information within your authentication backend configuration for AWS. It's pretty cool. But remember what we talked about before, um, vault security is viral and uh, Terraform is no exception there. We actually had a pretty cool webinar where we explained the, um, some of the approaches you can take to make sure that you're um, not leaking secrets and doing things like that. Most of the stuff is as you expect. Even when using Terraform, you should be using Ethereal tokens. We actually um, did a big rehaul of the vault provider in 2.0 a few months ago. And one of the things it can do is it can actually um, create sub tokens as part of the Terraform provider process. And so the idea is that you're using ethereal tokens for that. So if someone manages to get the token that you used as part of that Terraform run, they can't do anything with it afterwards. So you're keeping best practices across the board there. So I recommend uh, watching that webinar if you want to know more. So one important thing is with any automation, um, there's no point automating everything and then just hoping that every time that you do it, it doesn't go wrong. You want to automate the testing of it as well. So this is fairly easy to set up. This is an example for Travis. Um, basically, all we're doing is um, there's actually a, as you can see there, there is a flag to run a Vault server as dev. Um, and when you're running it as dev, it starts unsealed with a single root token and a single unsealed token. And you can also, um, as a parameter, set what the root token will be. So for your test, it'll basically spin up um, a temporary uh, Vault server, which is kept where everything is stored in memory. Obviously, don't use this in prod. I hope people don't need to be told that. Um, but then the idea is that you know, in this uh, steps, we're doing an install, so we're downloading the latest version of Vault. We're doing some linting with Terraform. We're doing an apply, and then going through and doing that test. So we can kind of consistently test that. And what's really good is that with that, you can start testing uh, provider versions. You can test new Terraform versions. You can test new Vault versions. So you've got a pretty good idea that doing a Vault upgrade or changing to a new provider or um, changing the Vault version won't cause any problems for your deployments. And if you really want to go all out with the testing, you can actually test the entire creation of your um, uh, cluster with um, Terraform itself. So um, Gruntworks, who actually wrote um, the original modules that I referenced earlier on, uh, have a tool called TerraTest. It's basically a bunch of helpers to write tests to actually test the cluster itself. So in this example, it's actually creating a vault cluster and then SSHing on and actually running the vault operation, uh, operator in it. So it's not just doing a Terraform run and seeing if it plan, the plan apply works and the plan. It'll actually do explicit tests within that. Obviously, depending on your um, kind of cloud resourcing, um, your costs internally, this might not always be possible, especially if you're going for like the big beefy uh, boxes or you're doing like a really big vault deployment. Um, but if you really want to reduce risk and you want to really know that any changes you make won't cause any problems, this is a really good way of doing it. So early on, we talked about immutability, and we talked about using the kind of full hashy stack. And one of the really good benefits of the hashy stack is everything works together, and Packer is perfect for this. So you can actually create a golden image of Vault, and the idea is that if anything goes wrong with it, if you need to do an upgrade, all you need to do is create a new image. And as we said, upgrading is just a case of adding it in. And um, if it's a uh, HA cluster, you would just upgrade all the standbys, and then when the standbys are upgraded, uh, turn the active off and then go through them. If you're doing a single node cluster, it's literally just a case of upgrading the image and everything goes from there. And for ongoing management, there's tons of config management tools out there. So full disclosure, I used to work at Puppet. I've been using Puppet for like seven or eight years now. Uh, I actually have code in the Puppet module uh, that's up there. I use Puppet code to manage my own vault clusters at home. So I'm pretty biased when it comes to that. But the idea is as long as you keep in mind what we talked earlier on about virality, about how um, whatever tools you're using will also be part of the Vault threat model. Um, it's fine to use config management to uh, manage Vault in the future. Um, it's generally, because config management generally already is running as some sort of very high level process because it's making file system changes, it's not a huge worry most of the time, but it's one thing to think about. Cool. So that's kind of like the high level view, that's automation of Vault, and that's all the various things you need to think about. So here's my two cool tips that I'll throw in at the end so you don't feel too cheated because we've talked very high level here. So when it comes to automation of uh, the console backend in terms of upgrades, there's a really cool feature in Console Enterprise. Um, so essentially what it's called is called Autopilot. And what it will do is that you are automating the server upgrade to avoid downtime. And that process works. New servers are added in. 
Um, as higher versions of console are added in, they will auto-join. Um, autopilot will go through. Um, it'll wait till enough upgraded console clusters have been added in and join the cluster, and there's enough quorum for them. And then it will start to demote the old clusters uh, and then promote the new ones up. So it's a pretty cool kind of blue-green automated way of doing this. So you can do this yourself um, with scripting and things like that, but this is fully uh, kind of automated as part of the product itself. And when it comes to automation, you can actually, there's this extra feature that not a lot of people know about called upgrade version tag. So what this will do is instead of looking at the console version itself, you can specify a version that you want to use to compare between the two. So let's say there's a new vulnerability for OpenSSL or you want to upgrade the version of Ubuntu on the, disk itself, or on the um, image itself. If you have two console versions um, that you want to upgrade, both for 1.5, and then you try and do that with Autopilot, it's going to say, oh, these are the same version. I'm not going to do that. So with this, you actually specify a little bit of meta information, and it will use that to compare between the two. So in this example, I've got a Calver of 2019.09.01. Um, I do my upgrade or upgrade my images. Maybe the console version still stays the same, but then I change the upgrade tag to 0902. When it comes in, Autopilot looks between the two numbers, compares the two, and says this is newer, and then the process will work the same. So it's a really good way of doing that kind of rolling update without having to have console be a newer version. So the second one that's really important, vault backups. So in terms of like a full cluster backup, the main way of doing that would be um, using something like uh, a performance replica, um, which is a part of the console enterprise, uh, so the Vault Enterprise stack. So the idea is that you have a standby Vault cluster. It's kept synchronized with the active Vault cluster. Everything's in there. Um, ethereal authentication tokens, time-based authentication tokens, token usage data, everything's in there. So basically, it's a cold standby. Um, so it gives you a pretty aggressive recovery point um, if you have any sort of situations where keeping things going are the utmost concern. Um, so it's, it's pretty good. But this doesn't cover every single uh, use case here, right? Um, there's a certain uh, kind of error uh, kind of field that you can have with this that you don't really get covered. And that's unintentional or intentional sabotage. So if you have um, purposeful or accidental corruption of data, or even you know someone's stolen your actual cloud control access, maybe someone's fished your keys or something like that, you have no real way of uh, recovering from that. Um, because the DR replication is designed to replicate actual live data, any kind of intentional or unintentional corruption would be replicated across, and then you've got two useless systems. So the idea is that you should be um, backing up vault storage backend itself. So console itself has a snapshot feature. All it does is it will um, take a snapshot of the current data it has and just save it to disk, all pretty normal. So if you're using open source, you'd have to write some sort of scripting, maybe a cron job, to run a snapshot and then ship it off-site into whatever way you want to do. Um, if you're running enterprise, uh, you have the backup agent feature. So what it will do is it will basically run the snapshot command as an actual service in console with the full um, kind of health checks that you get from that. So it does all the kind of standard minutia that you expect from a backup solution. So it does rotation of files. Um, it saves things off-site. It tells you how, many, uh, how often you want to run the task and how much you want to retain and that kind of thing. So all the kind of things you expect from a backup solution. So oops, not sure if you can see that, but the idea is that it would run as an actual service. It uses the same binary as console. So you run it. Um, what it will do is it will actually perform a mini leadership election for the actual thing to make sure that when it does the backup process, it's not in the middle of doing something console related. So it won't try to do a backup in the middle of a leadership election or if something's gone wrong. So it's a really good way of making sure that when you're actually doing these full-scale backups, nothing's going wrong at the time. So you can see it's doing scanning for leadership. It's got the leadership. It saves the snapshot. If you're running in S3, it's going to ship the uh, backups up to S3. You can actually encrypt the backups themselves with another key. Remember that the backups, the information in console is already encrypted with the master key from Vault. So it's already encrypted. But if you want to double encrypt it, because that's just how you are, you can actually encrypt it with a separate key as well. And then you probably want to write something like this, like a systemd unit file, and just have that running at the same time as console's running. And then you have a full backup that you can hydrate a full system back to if you worry about anything going wrong. Either, as I said, either unintentional or intentional sabotage. So what about the future? So who here is on Vault 1, 2? A few hands. Who here is using the internal raft storage? 
good, because it's, uh, it's still in tech preview, so you shouldn't be using it. Uh, but the idea is to uh, reduce the kind of operational complexity that comes with trying to run a console cluster. Um, in uh, Vault 1.2, and will be hardened in a few releases time, we had tech preview of internal storage. So it's using the same RAF protocol that console is using, but it's just built into Vault itself. So instead of needing uh, five console servers, three Vault servers, you just need three Vault servers. Um, so the idea is, uh, in terms of backups, it works in the same kind of way. Instead of using a console snapshot, you'll be hitting the API of Vault directly. In the future, we're going to be trying to integrate as many features as we can from the way the console's doing it. Obviously, as I said, it's a tech release to start with. So right now, you'd have to do some sort of scripting to do that. But luckily, no one put their hands up because I was going to shout at you if someone was doing it already. <laughs> cool. So what have we learned? We uh, have learned to keep in mind the core concept to follow when automating Vault, because you know, how long is a piece of string? There's so many pieces to it. We've reduced the blast radius wherever possible. We've learned where you know, we can and cannot follow um, the recommendations we have. Um, we've gone through, read the documents, and figured out the automation requirements, and then adapted those based on my, our organizational needs. Um, we've created the uh, compute resources with Terraform. We've continuously tested those to make sure that we're not doing anything wrong. We've used console snapshot for full backups in case of sabotage or accidental problems. And we've enabled console autopilot, so we've got a nice automated way of upgrading the console backend. Cool, and that's it. So thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, if you have questions, I'm going to be on the HashiConf, uh, HashiConf Slack at, at PMS. I'm at Peter Suter on Twitter. My email's up there as well, or come and talk to me in the corridor. Um, yeah, I've got lots of thoughts about how to deploy Vault and uh, the future of things coming on. Um, and if you have any questions about things like enterprise architecture and things like that, come talk to me afterwards. Thanks, everyone.